This is the fifth state winning headlines, your media police post coming to you from Nairobi, Kenya, from the Photo School of Government. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you may have missed this morning, but we also take a look at some of the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 18th of March 2021, and I am Tuel. I am CS. And I am GK. In case you missed the headlines, here they are. In the Daily Nation, Kwaheri Magufuli. In the Standard, Kwaheri Magufuli. And in the Star, we have an anomaly. JP uh, NEC set to kick out Ruto next Tuesday. Um, rest in peace, obviously, Magufuli. But can Absolutely. we begin with the Star, and then we'll come back to Magufuli? Absolutely. Today's Machakos by election is a pointer to three things. One, the impeachment of William Ruto. Two, a possible super coalition. And three, the smoothening of BBI in parliament. Our bet is a fast two. And here is why. If you see President Kenyatta calling Kalonzo, Raila, Musalia, and Wetangula to speak in one voice in the Machakos by election, he has a bigger scheme up his sleeve. And in our view, it's impeachment, period. And we say this for two reasons. If the National Management Committee of the Jubilee Party has sanctioned the removal of William Ruto as deputy party leader, then it means Uhuru is slowly dismembering Ruto's roots. Mm -hmm. And once he is done ejecting him from the party, the next and final stop is parliament. And if Ruto has lost seven by elections in just two months, then the background of acceptance for his impeachment has been created. Uhuru is using the obvious strategy here. And Professor Mutai Ngonyi always says that the best strategy is always the obvious strategy. Mm -hmm. But that is not all. We want to hypothesize that Ruto's replacement exists within the super coalition. Mm -hmm. And that's because if Ruto's 1.4 million votes in 2017 are to be weighted, Uhuru may need someone with equal numerical strength. Question is, who amongst the NASA bearded sisters <laughs> Will it be? The bearded sisters. I didn't realize that there were seven yes, by elections. Seven, seven by elections. That he has lost. Absolutely. <laughs> including Machakos. Oh, well, let, let's turn a bit to uh, the passing away of John Joseph Pombe Magufuli. Yeah. Um, it was said that he passed away yesterday, despite rumors that it may have happened before. So John Joseph Pombe Magufuli was a man who skillfully played the long political game. In 1995, he ran for the Chato parliamentary seat and he won. That was his hometown. Mm -hmm. the, the year, that year, the president also, uh, uh, the president at the time, B Benjamin Mkapa, appointed him mm -hmm. deputy minister for works, transport and communication. Mm -hmm. And Magufuli drove an ambitious road building project, uh, earning himself the nickname The Bulldozer. Yeah. He served in cabinet for a whopping 20 years until 2015 when he ran for the presidency. Yeah. And there's a reason why he's often referred to as the accidental candidate. Yeah. In June 2015, four months before the election day, Magufuli was not seen as Chama Cha Mapinduzi's party's strongest candidate. Yeah. Uh, the front runner had been Edward Lawasa, yes. who had served as prime minister and then was forced to resign um, for three years under Jakaya Kikwete. Correct. So when Lawasa was forced to resign after being caught in a corruption scandal, Magufuli eventually won the nomination, mm -hmm. which came as a surprise to some within mm -hmm. this party. Mm. So Mkapa quietly pushed the party mm. to nominate Magufuli mm. and the former president and other party elders were for the first time advising the ruling party's central committee on the nomination of the presidential candidate. Yes. And this is how the bulldozer went mm. on to become Tanzania's fifth president. Yes. So two factors appear to have been critical to Magufuli's nomination uh, by Chama Chama Pinduzi mm. and his rise to the presidency. Mm. One, he had not been implicated in any corruption scandal. Mm. Uh, he had a reputation of getting things done. Mm. Uh, and while his direct competition at the time was Loasa, mm. Loasa was directly associated with a corruption uh, deal. So mm. that worked against him. Mm. But it is the second reason that I am more intrigued by. Mm. Magufuli was a middle ground candidate. He was not affiliated within any factions within the ruling party. Mm. So you find that after Loasa resigned in 2008, sharp divisions emerged between uh, now Chama Chama Pinduzi uh, members mm. who supported him mm. and those who supported then President Jakaya Kikwete. Yes. So Magufuli remained neutral and this is what ultimately worked in his favor. Mm. 
Magufuli appeared to avoid party politics. Mm -hmm. As a minister under Mkapa's and Kikweta's administrations, he focused on work and not party politics. And this made him the go-to guy mm -hmm. when his party needed a presidential candidate. Yes. Good politician find find the middle road. They yes. find some compromise. Oh, absolutely. And key lessons for our own political players here in Kenya is that the big in politics, the biggest mistake one can make is to try to outshine your master. Mm. It can only end ruinously, oh, as yes. some will see. Absolutely. And just like in game theory, and borrowing from Simon Sinek's book, uh, The Infinite Game, we can suggest that Magufuli played an inf infinite game in his politics. He was mm. constantly positioning himself to deal effectively with whatever challenges come up. Mm. Absolutely, I hope Karen was reading, I was listening to, right? to what you were saying. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so may you rest in peace, President Makufuli. May the region carry on with your spirit of independence and bulldozing. Absolutely. Yeah, though I, I guess when you talk about uh, taking the middle ground, you don't mean uh, being a watermelon. <laughs> don't be a watermelon, <laughs> but, but see the opportunity. <laughs> I'll say this, uh, uh, what you just said, GK, reminds me of, um, uh, Russia uh, and uh, just after the demise of Lenin, the struggle for power between uh, Trotsky and uh, Stalin. Yeah. And how Stalin's strategy won the day. Yeah. Now, when the sun sets on the life of a nation's president, darkness seemingly descends for a time on the hope of a nation. Being African, one of our endearing qualities is that we do not speak ill of the recently departed. Yeah. So as the sun has set on the life of Dr. John Pombe Magufuli, I would like to recall some of the light um, he left us. And specifically, I would like to highlight the fact that he chose a woman vice president. The consequence uh, of this is that all things remaining equal, uh, Samia Suluhu Hassan is now set to join an elite club of women political leaders. I'd like to believe that um, this will greatly help advance conversations on gender parity, equality, and women's rights, especially uh, when back home we're deeply invested in efforts to also advance these conversations mm. through elements of the Constitutional Amendment Bill 2020. And so I thought this would be, therefore be a good opportunity to shine a spotlight, celebrating um, past and present African women heads of state and or government. On the continent and in the region, mm -hmm. Samia Suluhu is set to join the ranks of a few African um, women currently at the pinnacle yes. of political leadership. Mm. This includes President uh, Sahalewak Zaude of mm. Ethiopia, mm. Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Sarah Kogongelewa of Namibia, mm. Prime Minister Cecil Manora Hata of Madagascar, mm. Prime Minister Rose Christine Raponda of Gabon, and Prime Minister Victor Tomega Dogbe of Togo. Mm. These are incumbent women leaders across our continent. Mm. But there have also been quite a few other notable women at the helm of African leadership in the past. Mm. Uh, as far back as 1975, there was Elizabeth uh, Domitien, mm. uh, who served as Prime Minister of the Central African Republic from 1975 to 1976. She was the first woman in Africa to serve as Prime Minister. In Guinea-Bissau, there was Carmen Pereira, who was acting president for a brief period in 1984. She was Africa's first woman head of state. In Sao Tome and Principe, there was um, uh, Maria Desneves, Prime Minister from 2002 to 2004. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, there was Ivy Matsepe Kasaburi, mm -hmm. who was acting as well as interim President of South Africa in September of 2005. In Mozambique, there was Prime Minister Luisa Diaz Diogo from 2004 to 2010. In Liberia, there was Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was Africa's first elected woman president and who served two consecutive terms from 2006 to 2018. In Gabon, there was Rose Francine Rogombe, served as interim president from June to October of uh, 2009. In Mauritius, you had Agnes Bellepieu, who served as interim president twice, first between March and July of 2012, and then between May and June of 2015. In Malawi, mm -hmm. uh, we had Joyce Banda, who served as president from 2012 to 2014. She was also the country's first female vice president, and Forbes would go on to name her as the 40th most powerful woman in the world, and the most powerful woman 
in, uh, in, in, in Africa. And then uh, in Senegal, there were two female prime ministers, Mame Madioboye from 2000 uh, to 2002, and subsequently Amina Toure from 2013 to 2014. Mm -hmm. In Central African Republic, Catherine Samba served as president from 2014 to 2016. In Mauritius, there was Amina Gurib Hakim, who was unanimously elected as president by uh, the National Assembly and served from 2015 to 2018. Closer home in Burundi, there was Sylvie Kiningi, who was uh, president of Burundi from February to October of 1993. She was also prime minister from February of 93 to October of 94. And around the same time in Rwanda, there was Agathe Owelingi Mana, who served as the fourth prime minister of Rwanda from July 1993 until her assassination in April of 94 during that dark period in Rwanda's history. Wow, that was, Whoa. that's an extensive list. Extensive. I'm wondering when is Kenya's turn. <laughs> <laughs> so rest in peace, uh, Mr. Makufuli. Rest in peace, Pas yeah. Safiri Salama. Um, um, so on that note, we will give uh, winning headlines to the Daily Nation and the Standard. And now, final thought, it is inspired by a book entitled Good Economics for Hard Times, mm. Better Answers to Our Biggest Problems by Abhijit Banjeri <laughs> <laughs> of Banerji and Esther Duflo. So, uh, as Kevin butchered that name, yeah. uh, Abhijit Banerji <laughs> and Esther Duflo also jointly wrote the bestseller Poor Economics, which came out in 2011. Interestingly, two weeks before Good Economics for Hard Times came out in 2019, the two authors won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. So at the very least, we can deduce that they are committed to their chosen labor of love. Mm. The book is a masterful effort reflecting on how to deal with today's critical economic problems from immigration and inequality, globalization and technological disruption, slowing growth and accelerating climate change, the book presents the argument that the resources to address these challenges are there, but what we lack are the ideas that will help us reconcile our polarized stances on these issues. Mm. That said, uh, some of the arguments the authors advance may not be very popular, it may even be termed using that seemingly counterintuitive phrase, inconvenient truths. <laughs> I'll take one example to drive this point home precisely because it addresses a debate that has been raging in the country this week. People were utterly shocked when the government spokesman uh, pretty much suggested that we should be grateful we're not taxed as highly as people in other countries and he unfortunately chose European countries as his benchmark. So the authors of our book today dispel the popular notion that a sure way to boost the economy is uh, through re tax reductions for the wealthy, which would have the effect of uh, more disposable income, therefore more money to spend and circulate in the economy, plus people are more incentivized to be more productive. Mm. What the authors argue is that evidence has shown that tax cuts specifically for the wealthy often do little, if anything, to accelerate growth. The question one then wonders is whether the same is true when those tax cuts are extended to the rest of the economy, not just the wealthy. And I believe we have some recent evidence of this right here in Kenya. Now, I need to be very careful because I'm seated beside two very good economists. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I am a lawyer. I'd like to argue that here in Kenya, we saw that Uhuru's tax cuts as part of his eight-point economic stimulus plan last year were integral to saving the Kenyan economy from a recession. Mm -hmm. In fact, the sum effect of was that our economy showed resilience and grew when there was economic contraction across the globe. And our economy is projected to grow at a higher rate than the global economic average in the coming year. So I think uh, we can see a correlation and possibly a causation between Uhuru's tax cuts, which cost the government 137 billion shillings in tax revenue, with our exceptional growth uh, compared to the rest of the globe. Mm. Yes. Like that. You know, CS, that part of the government <coughs> spokesman saying that uh, Kenyans sh uh, sh should stop whining <laughs> because Europe, uh, Europeans are charged more taxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's right. <laughs> Simple. Simple. <laughs> He's right. And he probably should be taxed more. Anyway, I love the chapter on, on, on Ludites. And I think the voodoo economist, David D, is one. I don't know if it's Ludites or, uh, 
or Luddite, <laughs> right? Uh, and how, de how dare he say that SGR is not necessary? How does civil society blame the state for the loss of jobs? Anyway, before I go further, allow me to explain what a Luddite is. Mm. A Luddite is a stubborn man who refuses technological progress for fear that he will be replaced. Mm. Mm. The Luddite movement uh, in England, for example, actually began in the vicinity of Nottingham in England yeah. towards the end of 1811 with the Owen textile mill workers called for the destruction of new, of new machinery that was slowly replacing them. And when you think about it, it does remind you of the SGR Hula Baloo mm -hmm. by D and the civil society. They are the, the exact replica of the Luddite movement. I can't help but think that Kenya had for over 100 years relied on a single lane road and a snaky railway to transport labor and cargo. Then here comes a faster mode of transport that can move cargo and human capital three times faster to and fro twice a day. Then this civil society Luddites appear on screen and tell us that it wasn't necessary to build SGR, we should have just used the old rail, that's what they said. Mm -hmm. I want to ask these fellows a few <coughs> questions. Mm -hmm. What happened to the postman after Gmail and <laughs> Yahoo set up? <laughs> right? He became irrelevant. What happened to landlines after mobile phones showed up? They became irrelevant. And that's the nature of market dynamics. The introduction of a faster, more efficient order spells doom for an existing slower and less efficient order. It is the way of nature. If your ability to adapt is compromised, then your existence is also compromised. Mm. And as I finish, I want to dedicate this to this <coughs> toxic critic of government. It is a quote by John Maynard Keynes. Mm. He says, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. <laughs> Madmen in authority who hear voices in air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. David D, do you read? Wow, does Ooh. he copy? <laughs> Interesting stuff. Um, it was a, a, a bit of a dry book for me, on, on, on my, in my opinion. Yeah, um, yeah. But, um, so there were interesting thoughts, right? So like their thoughts on, in chapter three, they make the thesis that goods can circulate freely in global trade agreements, but people and money cannot move easily. And then I thought to myself, I beg to differ a little bit. Mm -hmm. Money is moving much more easily in the past few years than it ever has, thanks yeah. to advances in mobile money, digital financing, and fintech platforms. <laughs> and then it got me thinking to some of the big things that have happened in the past year, uh, last year and this year. <coughs> A uh, company such as Nigerian startup called Flutterwave mm. is now valued at $1 billion. It's a unicorn, really. Mm. And is now working with PayPal to bring in more than 300 million PayPal users to, the Africa, to African businesses. So moving money, yeah. accepting yeah. payments across the continent just got easier. You have our very own Wapi Pay, um, which is Kenyan, yes. uh, a Kenyan startup that moves money from Eastern Africa to uh, China and the rest of Asia at the, you know, as quickly as M-Pesa. Yes. Um, so we have a situation in which the mm -hmm. pandemic um, and advances in technology have literally caused a disruption and acceleration um, pushing foreign and domestic um, you know, innovators to develop opportunities, especially in financial technology. But then I thought to myself, Flutterwave is Nigerian, uh, Paystack, which raised $200 million, also you know, based out in Nigeria. And I was thinking to myself, why are Kenyan startups not being able to reach this status? And I want Kenyans to start thinking about, especially the government, to start thinking about how to capitalize mm. on such moments, this opportune moment. Um, what is Nigeria doing that we aren't? Um, it's time to rethink our regulations. How do we build this startup nation? How do we get our central bank and the government and everybody else to be more accommodative? Mm. And also where we agree on this is that economies have become more liberalized. So we're doing more business with different people uh, from across the world than we ever have. Um, but we need to protect our own industries and I think the example I was giving earlier is that if if if, if government doesn't support its emerging or startup uh, companies mm. then this is why M-Pesa will remain to be the only thing that we have come up with in a very long time mm. um, because they're the biggies and they're easy to protect but how do we get new M-Pesas new versions of these innovations mm. out there so this book gave me lots of uh, food for thought um, mm. because it got me to think yeah what are the type of economics we should be having in these hard times of uh, a pandemic?
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Um, and, I, and I think, um, you know, on those thoughts, uh, the government is introducing quite a few regulations and policies focused on the digital economy. Yeah. And you're quite right. That's one of the ways to foster, mm -hmm. you know, innovation and, um, and, uh, and, and new startups that will raise yeah. foreign capital. Yeah, and, 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 and uh, look, CS, you spoke to uh, the stimulus package. And, and the tax cuts that happen, they all, I mean, we cut transaction fees on mobile money. And if you see what, 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 what Kenya, was transa uh, Kenya transacted on mobile money, just mobile money value last mm. year was 5.2 trillion shillings. Mm. Do you know what we transacted back in 2019? 4.3 trillion shillings. It's, mm. a, it's an additional, what, 900 billion. That's almost a trillion bob yeah. on mobile money. Yeah. Like, mm. we literally uh, transact a half of our GDP on mobile phone. Yeah. In fact, we should even pay back our national debt <laughs> on M-Pesa. <laughs> on M-Pesa. <laughs> That's what it means. Well, guys, on a day where we had uh, winning headlines from both <coughs> Daily Nation and The Standard, I want to leave you with this. Uh, the couple had written another book, and it's called uh, Poor Economics, Rethinking Poverty and the Ways to End It. And they have a quote that goes, the poor are no less rational than anyone else. Quite the contrary. Precisely because they have so li little, we often find them putting much careful thought into their choices. They have to be sophisticated economists just to survive. Uh, so I like that. I like the, um, uh, their way of spinning <laughs> poverty, I guess. Uh, so kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel, find us on TV and go TV, thank you, and start with